what I, what I intend to do today, um, uh, and I, I think we're going to have a little fun doing it, is um, what the heck's going on in the economy and the markets, how we see it at Federated Hermes. My job at Federated, I do run uh, a global allocation fund. I'm our head of multi-assets, but it's my job along with our chief investment officers and chief strategists to come up with our view on the markets, uh, on the economy, and then how we position our strategies and, and help our clients position. So I'm hoping to give you all a, a really good overview, plan to go about 30 minutes, and then I hope there's lots of questions because that's always fun. So I'm gonna try this clicker, let's hope it works. And there we go, all right, we're good. In the 15 years I've been with Federated Hermes, I can't remember a time that our committee has had a harder time coming up with a consensus view on where things are headed. Um, and, and we've invested through kind of 2008, certainly through COVID, so, you know, we've been around a little bit. Don't let the boyish good looks fool you. Uh, I'm older than I look. Um, to that end, there are shades of 1939 in terms of geopolitics, shades of 1979 in terms of commodity prices, which is good for you people, for everyone down here, um, and there's shades of 1999 in terms of some of the tech valuations. And so how do you digest all that? How do you figure that out? So we're going to go through it, and uh, here we go. First thing to know is, you know, the economic recovery is over. We're in expansion. Uh, good news is, is we've made back all that was lost during COVID in terms of income at a national level. Bad news is you get more volatility when you get into an expansion. So your average returns in the market from recession until GDP gets back to its prior peak are roughly about 8% per quarter, right? That falls to about 5% per quarter once you're now in expansion. Uh, and any given quarter could be plus or minus 15. So first lesson is the easy low volatility money has been made. You should expect volatility at this point forward. That's a normal part of a cycle. Um, recession doesn't look like it's on the horizon at this point. So what this is, this is a recession dashboard. We come out with this once a month. If you're interested in receiving it, we've got a distribution list. But we look at a number of things to say, okay, what's the risk of a recession coming? We look at what's going on in the labor market, unemployment claims. We look at what's going on in inflation, what's going on in housing. The yield curve. You'll notice my yield curve's not inverted here. We don't use the seven and three quarters year to eight and a quarter year yield curve. We use the, the three month to 10 year. Tre uh, uh, credit spreads and manufacturing. All of them look green except for one, which is gonna be the focus of what we talk about today, which is inflation. Inflation is hot, it's historically hot. It, it is even hotter than the numbers would tell you it is, and we'll go through why, and it isn't going anywhere anytime soon in our view. I'm gonna skip COVID because I don't like talking about it. Um, so let's talk about this inflation. We've been, we've been screaming from the rooftops for a better part of a year and a half that it's not transitory. It's real, it's persistent, and we're gonna talk about it. There's three different drivers that are really heating this up right now. Commodities are the first one, right? Commodities. And this is tied in some way to what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. Not caused by it, that's made it worse. But what's going on? I didn't realize, I don't know if anyone in this room realized, Russia and Ukraine collectively are the Iowa of the rest of the world. So it's not just about oil and gas, of which 10% of the world's oil and gas comes from that region. It's not just about that. It's about things like nickel. 28% of the world's nickel comes from that region. No nickel, no electric car battery. All right. It's about palladium. About 25% of the world's palladium comes from that region. No palladium, no catalytic converters, no cars. It's about, let's keep going, neon. You want to manufacture a semiconductor? You need neon. 50% of the world's neon is in Ukraine. A quarter of the world's wheat, including 75% of the wheat that goes to the Middle East. We all know what happens when a bunch of hangry men in the Middle East don't get their wheat. It's not a good day in the Middle East. And, I didn't know this either, Ukraine surpassed the United States as the leading exporter of corn into China. 12% of all calories that are consumed on any given day of the year come from Russia and Ukraine. 12%. So you had pressure on commodities because we were all going about our lives, living, moving, 
Not being you know, under house arrest, I come from the People's Republic of New Jersey. It was house arrest. Uh, and we know that supply chains have been under pressure, whether it's from regulatory reasons or ESG reasons or just labor shortage reasons. So you got commodity inflation, that's one. All right, the second one is supply chains related to pandemic. China, you know, China is in the middle of a two week shutdown of Shanghai because they had about 3,000 cases of COVID. They're still pursuing COVID zero. That's like me still trying to pursue an MBA career. It's a dream, it ain't gonna happen. The point is they keep shutting down. They keep shutting down the ports, they keep shutting down the cities, that's creating backlogs. And then the final one, and this is the most important one, labor market. You gotta remember, before the pandemic, we were at a 50 year low in unemployment in the United States. A 50 year low. That was on an economy that for 10 years was growing between one and a half and 2%. Well, now all of a sudden you're trying to grow that same economy 5.6% last year, four this year, maybe three next year. Add on to it, one and a half percent of the United States population has left the labor force. They're not looking for work anymore. And everybody's waiting for these freeloaders to come back. The problem is they're not freeloaders. Two thirds of them retired. They retired, they pulled it forward, why? Because why wouldn't you? Your stock value is at an all-time high. Your home value is at an all-time high. If you had a small business, when rates are zero, when's a better time to sell it? Government gave you a bunch of money you probably didn't need, and the world's still insane, so you retire. I can assure you, I probably won't ever retire, but if I do, it's going to take major personal financial calamity to get me back out. And absent that, I'm not doing it. So you've lost, and I'll show you the, the, the stats here, or the chart, You've had excess retirements of over 1% of the population. Folks aren't coming back. Now, let's talk about this labor force. You've got, I'm gonna see if I can go back a second. Well, I'll just leave it here. You've got on any given month now, seven million Americans looking for work and 11 and a half million open jobs. So you put everybody back to work, you've still got three and a half, four million extra jobs sitting out there. On top of that, four million Americans are quitting their job each month, but unemployment's falling. Where do you think they're going? I'm gonna tell you where they're going. We had somebody left our company, was with us for eight years. She got paid 40% more to do 20% less from home. That's where they're going, and they have to, because even though wages are up 5.5%, prices are up eight. So you got your 5.5% raise, that's the good news. Your bad news is, is it buys you two and a half, three percent less than it did a year ago. That's the beginnings of a wage price spiral. That's real, that's sustainable, that's sticky, that doesn't stop on its own. Inflation doesn't get tired, it needs to be killed. And the Fed, we think, finally woke up on this. So this is a little chart we do, I don't need to get real technical on it, other than to say, see those gray bars? When those gray bars are above the zero line, the Fed's supposed to be hiking. In the past, they have. Look how high they've gotten this time and for how long before they started hiking. We think they're somewhere between six and 12 months later than they should be on the first hike, which means they've got some wood to chop. So to that end, we came into this year thinking that the Fed would hike four times this year, four times next year. That's laughable now. The Fed communicated last month that they would hike seven times this year, seven, 25 basis point increases with three or four more next year. The market has since laughed at them and priced in somewhere between 10 and 11 hikes this year, implying that we could have 350 basis point hikes at some point. We think we're gonna get 50 basis points in May, we think we're gonna get 50 basis points in June at a minimum. And here's the kicker, it ain't enough. Think about it this way. The last time the Fed was hiking, between 2016 and 2019, inflation barely got above 2.5%. To get inflation from 25 to 2, they hiked 10 times over about two years. So now you think 12 or 13 hikes over two years is gonna get you from 10% down to two? Because we're heading to 10. We're heading to 10 in the next couple of months, or at least nine. In fact, I think we'll see nine next week based on some of the commodity pressures. 
You've got inflation break-even rates that are above where interest rates are, meaning real rates are negative. You can't kill inflation until you get real rates positive. And so we think there's upside risk to the amount of hikes they're going to do in the next couple of years. Um, they've committed an error. If you want to know how that they've committed an error, here's our view. It should have never, ever, ever in the history of humans been true that interest rates were zero, the Fed was buying bonds, and inflation was 8%. Those three things should never be true at the same time. Now the question is, can they hike fast enough to get that inflation back under control, but not so fast to kill the recovery? We think there's a good shot of that. We think there's a chance, but there's a lot of risk around it. There's a lot of risk, so we'll go into that in a second. All right, good news and bad news on Fed rate hikes. Fed have hiked rates you know, more than two or three consecutive times. Uh, 11 times since 1970. The good news is 12 months after the first hike, S&P 500 is up about 7% on average. Bad news is after each of those 11 hiking cycles, you had a recession. Except for two. One of them came before Black Monday in 1987. The other one came before the Mexican peso, Asian financial, long-term capital management issue in the mid-90s. So, is a hike cycle going to lead to recession? Yeah, almost certainly. Question is when. Our view is it's not for a while. Consumers in the U.S. saved two and a half trillion extra dollars during the pandemic. That's a lot of extra money to roll through. So our view is that recession in 2022 is very low, essentially non-existent. Some chance in 23, 24 is where we see that big risk. And that's why equity markets, we think, still are going to do okay in the next couple of years. All right, I'm going to skip this on the earnings. Here's the two things that are affecting the stock market when I try to take that economic view and, and translate it into the market. Um, stocks can be very expensive when interest rates are zero. Right? Think about it this way. When I sell a bond and interest rates are zero, it costs me nothing. I'm foregoing no income. Now, if you give me free money, I'm going to gamble with it, right? I'm going I'm to buy things that are high risk, high reward, long duration. If all of a sudden, when I have to sell a bond, I'm giving up 2.5% of income every year, well, now there's no gambling, right? I've got to make that money back today, and I need something that has real earnings and will produce a cash flow. So when inflation is low, when interest rates are low, PE multiples on the market are high. When they move higher, and that's the point of this chart here, I can point it here, when inflation moves higher, when interest rates move higher, your PEs tend to fall. And so that's caused us to downgrade our upside in the market. We came into this year thinking that the S&P could hit 5,300. We think that's 4,800, so a flat year. By the way, that's hot off the presses. We just announced that last night, so I get to break it to you. Big, that and a dime will get you real far. Um, but we're down to 4,800 this year. We think we might be able to march to 5,100 next year. So some upside, but limited. Now there's two determining factors here. One, how bad does Russia and Ukraine go? And I'm gonna spend just a second talking about that. Our view is that this isn't gonna end quickly. That, uh, and it's been our view all along. Um, the way we think this plays out in Russia, Ukraine, is the Russian army has underperformed every expectation, and they kind of have a history of doing that. R Russians don't do soldiering all that well. Uh, so what they end up doing is they make up for poor soldiering with a lot of bombs. And so the way we think this plays out is the Russians will ultimately control the southeastern portion, or so, excuse me, south, yeah, southeastern portion of the country. The Ukrainians will effectively defend the northwestern part of the country and then we, 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 we shoot each other from the rubble. Um, we think at some point, once that's locked in, it goes one of two ways. Either you get more serious about negotiations or something happens on the humanitarian front that escalates it. We're hoping it's the former. Either way, I have every expectation that in a month's time we're still gonna be there, which means all of a sudden those wheat stockpiles in the Middle East are getting depleted. Those commodity pressures are still in place, the Fed still has to be more, more aggressive. That's how we kind of get there. Question is, can the Fed get inflation to slow in the second half? We think it could do some. Our forecast is that if we're seeing 6.5% core inflation right now, maybe that goes to 5. 
by the end of the year. Not four or two, but something closer to five. All right, moving on. So what do you do with all this? This is a tough chart to see, but I'll walk you through it. So in an inflation environment, from an asset allocation perspective, what do you do? Well, first thing is you don't want long duration fixed income. Government bonds, corporate investment grade, domestic core, mortgage backs, munis. They don't do well in, a, in an inflationary environment. You want shorter duration bonds, and in an environment where you've got the Fed not only hiking this aggressively, but likely to have to be even more aggressive, you want the shortest duration bonds. That's cash. You don't want to be overweight cash here. Even in ultra short fixed income, you've still got some NAV risk. So you're going to prefer cash. You're going to prefer short duration fixed income over long. I still think you're okay in credit, right? Because we have not had enough hikes in the system yet to really slow the economy. If anything, it's still overheating. So I feel good about credit, asset-backed securities, even high yield. Now, not as much as I was. I pulled it back, but I still feel good about credit. Moving into equities, I don't want long duration equities. I don't want growth. I'm going to talk about growth in a second and all the risks we see around growth. I want things, if, if I could give you an idea of, of the playbook in an inflation environment, it's the revenge of the boring. It's all the stuff no one's wanted to own in seven years. The staples, the utilities, the energy, right? Things that produce real cash flows and have real yields. I'm going to walk you through that now. Um, so I didn't realize this until we did the numbers. Tech outperformed value, or growth outperformed value, more in the five years ended December 31st, 2021, than in the five years ended December 31st, 1999. More than the dot-com bubble. When I look at growth, all this chart is, is the Russell 1000 growth, so the largest growth companies, forward price to earnings ratio. Nothing, nothing fancy, no trends, no, n nothing kind of done to it. You'll notice that we were trading it 30 times at the beginning of the year. We've only traded it 30 times one other time during the dot-com bubble. Now, there's two reasons why we traded it 30 times. One, interest rates were zero. So again, I'm going to take a longer term, higher risk, higher reward bet with my money. The second reason is because I watched that show Bridgerton. Anyone in this room watch Bridgerton? All right. So no offense, but I hate that thing. All right. I watched about half of an episode, and I fell asleep. But I'm going to tell you why I watched it. I watched it because I was, in fact, under house arrest in the People's Republic of New Jersey for a year and a half. I had watched everything you could watch. I watched that tiger lady, whoever, that, whoever she was. Everything you could watch, I watched. And my wife said, Steve, we're going to watch Bridgerton. Now, if you ever meet my wife, she's much stronger than I am. So I said, sweetie, okay, I'm going to watch Bridgerton. Now, here's the thing. The moment that house arrest was lifted in New Jersey was the last time I will ever watch Bridgerton. I won't watch a commercial about Bridgerton. I don't want to see a trailer on Bridgerton. And I don't have to. I can leave my house. I'm going to go to dinner tonight and drink bourbon, and I'm not thinking about Bridgerton. Now, why am I saying that? Because that's a unique demand environment. I had to watch it. I didn't have a damn choice. Right? That's never going to happen again unless I get locked into my home again. So you had growth companies with low rates supporting their multiples and a unique demand environment. My entire life was held through three screens. That does not exist anymore. So I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the companies. I'm not saying I won't watch Netflix. I'm not saying I canceled my subscription. I'm just saying, should I pay 50% more for it than I normally do? And I don't think the answer to that is yes. So if I look prior to the pandemic, oh, I was not supposed to go there. If I look prior to the pandemic, I can't go back. The thing traded somewhere between 17 and 21 times on an average of 20. I think it should go back to 20. Well, that implies a 40% decline in some of these growth stocks. And I thought that was crazy when we came up with it, except then it happened to Netflix, and then it happened to Facebook, right? A trillion dollar company. And then it's happened to a certain asset manager that has all these innovative companies that they offer in an ETF. And it's happened to Bitcoin, and it's happened to Clorox, and it's happened to a lot of those plays that benefited from me being locked at home. So what's the alternative? Boring. I'm going to show you another chart. So this chart on the left, the blue line is the same chart I just showed you. 
which was the PE on growth companies. The orange line was the PE on dividend paying stocks. Staples, utilities, healthcare, pharma, well, that is healthcare. Um, what am I missing here? Real estate. The stuff no one's wanted to own in seven years. It's trading at 12 times. The chart on the right shows you the difference between what these two things are trading at. Normally, boring trades at a discount of maybe one or two PE multiples. It's trading at a 12 PE multiple discount. If that equalizes, folks, you're talking about something between 75 and 90% outperformance for the boring over the exciting. That's where I think we're headed. Why? Because if rates rise, these companies have raised price if inflation's in place. Who here has bought a box of cereal recently? It's a little bit more expensive than it was. My wife comes home from the grocery store every week, and she is miserable. I don't even talk to her when she comes home from the damn grocery store, right? Um, they've taken price for the first time in a decade. They have yield. I can't have a portfolio with 1% or 2% income in an 8% inflation environment. It's like taking 6% of my money and setting it on fire. Now, if I got a 4% yield, I'm still setting some money on fire, but it's less. And I can get that in dividend stock. They don't get hit as much when rates rise relative to bonds. So we think this is the, this is the trade. We're, the way we're positioning our portfolios is in a barbell. I want cyclical, economic-sensitive companies for today. Energy, financials, industrials, materials. But then, somewhere over the course of the next year or so, I don't know if, we, if it's when we're four hikes in, or five hikes in, or six hikes in, or whatever damn number of hikes it is, I'm not going to want to own a bunch of economically sensitive companies. I'm not going to want to be loaded up on tech that's seeing its PE multiples fall. I'm going to want the revenge of the boring, so I'm buying them now. That's our highest conviction call. All right, a couple other things. This should be the time for Europe. Should be. Every year should be the time for Europe. I feel like Charlie Brown with a darn football. But it should be the time for Europe because they have less growth and a lot more value in their, in their stock market indices. I'm not going to stand here and tell you to buy it in the middle of a ground war in Europe. If this continues to persist and it impacts energy prices, they're going into recession. We probably don't. They probably do. If you get any sense of clearing or any sense that this thing is wrapping up, I do think you want to jump in there. All right, China. I'm going to talk about China for a second. China's got a debt problem, but it's something bigger than that. I'm going to skip ahead here, and I don't know how I'm going to go back, but I'm going to skip ahead because it's going to be worth it. So just bear with me for a second. I'm going to show you the most important chart we got in here. And it's the ugliest. It's this one. So we've been generally pretty bearish on emerging markets, China in particular. I want to walk you through some. I, I, I'm a believer that demographics are destiny. That there's really only two ways that economies grow. You have babies and you make new things. And that makes prices go up over the long run. You can get fancier with it, but that, that's about it. All right, so let's walk through this. Europe, in 1980 to 2000, had 11% working age population grow, growth. That fell to 3. It's currently minus 9. It's going to minus 10. There is a decimation going on in Europe. One out of every 10 workers here that are there today won't be there tomorrow. That, that's not good for growth, by the way. All right. Let's look at Japan. Japan went from 12% growth to minus 9 to minus 10 to minus 21. Japan has the highest debt to GDP of any country in the world, and it doesn't matter because no one's going to be alive to pay it. They're losing a fifth of their citizens. All right. Let's look at China. 62% growth went to 21, is now minus 5, and is going to minus 17. It looks exactly the same way Japan did. And there's nothing that they can do to fix it. And it has nothing to do with one China policy. Yeah, they were supposed to only have one kid, but they had a bunch more and they just didn't report them. It's like pools in Greece. They taxed pools, nobody reported their pools. Then one day they flew over with a plane, everybody had a pool. <laughs> What's going on in China is you had a bunch of people on farms. When you're on a farm, you have eight children per couple. You have eight children per couple. The moment you move to a city, that income-producing asset became, becomes an expense. Trust me, I got three kids. I love them. They haven't brought in one dime of income yet. They're a black hole of expenses. 
So your, 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 your number of children per family falls to two. The only way you refresh that is immigration. Well, there's two and a half billion people in China. They would need India to move in, right? And most people don't wake up and say, sweetie, let's go to an authoritarian regime. Sounds like fun, right? So that isn't changing. Now, one of the, even India, by the way, 63 to 38 to 24 to 13, continue to decelerate. One of these doesn't look like the other, and it's the United States. Yeah, we were at 29, we went to 15, we went to two. That was the bad news. That's behind us. We're going from two to eight. We're the only major economy in the world. Actually, it's us, Canada, Australia, that have accelerating population growth. That's huge. That's everything. Now, let's run this one more forward here. I went to China for cheap workers. There's two things going against it. If I run out of workers, if I'm losing one-fifth of all the workers in China, guess what's going to happen to the price of labor? It's going to go up. Number two, we've just been through an industrial revolution. Automation, AI, robotics. I don't run my machines, my factories with cheap labor anymore. I run them with cheap machines. So then the question is, do I still want that factory in China? And the answer in our view is no. I have higher shipping costs, and those are really hitting you right now. I have higher energy costs because they don't have any energy. I have no intellectual property protection, geopolitical risks. I've got unrest in Hong Kong. I've got unrest um, in Taiwan, potentially. And I've got the rocket man shooting stuff in the ocean in Korea. Lack of transparency. If you think there were only 200,000 cases of COVID in the Wuhan province in 2020, I've got a beautiful factory to sell you there right next to a wet market. The point I'm making is, is if you're sitting in business school, that's not where you're going to decide to put your widget factory. I think the next great emerging market, we've been writing about this and we're seeing it happen, is the middle of the United States. Not the whole country, but the center, right? We've got more land than you can fill with people. I always like to joke, if you don't believe me, come to Tulsa. There's room, folks. Right? So much energy, we're not doing this right now, but so much energy, you drill for oil, natural gas comes out of the ground, what do we do with it? For 10 years, we set it on fire. That's energy independent. Easy shipping routes to the east and west coast. I know we got train robberies right now. By the way, who had train robberies on their 2022 bingo card? I didn't have that. Um, easy shipping routes, still one of the lowest tax rates in the world. We've got wonderful bourbons, but no new diseases coming out of Kentucky, and amber waves of freaking grain. It's a big, big story, and we think it's gonna take place over, over an extended period of time. So, we do tend to prefer the U.S. over emerging markets. Last thing I'm going to say, because I, I, they got a little timer here, so they're going to gong me, I think, in about a minute. I've got some stuff on politics. I can show you the slides, but I'll just walk you through it briefly. Um, this far out before a midterm, you really have to look at macro indicators. You can't look race by race yet. The average president loses 28 seats in their first midterm in the House. 28 seats is the average. There have only been two presidents that didn't lose in their first midterm, it was Franklin Roosevelt in the middle of World War II, George W. from the great state of Texas in, uh, uh, right after 9-11. You need a unifying national emergency in order to, to not have an incumbent president lose seats. We do national emergencies plenty now, but we don't do the unifying kind anymore. So you look out, 28 seats is the average number of seats lost. The best predictor is the president's approval rating, net approval rating. President Biden right now has the lowest approval rating going into a midterm of any president ever. Donald Trump wasn't this unpopular until after January 6th, to put that into perspective. So if you run that through and you look at the relationship between approval rating and seats lost, you're looking most likely at a loss of somewhere between 45 and 55 seats in the House. If you look at the two races both in Virginia and New Jersey, the electorate swung about 14 points towards the Republican in those. They were an early indicator before the 2010 midterms. They were also an early indicator behind the Republican beating in 2018. So you start looking at that, any statewide Senate race that was within 10 points last time could be competitive this time. Um, I think you might get something in terms of policy on Build Back Better. If you do, it's going to be Build Back Small. There's not going to be, I think, anything major here. I think the Supreme Court battle or the decision to have a Supreme Court battle right now was an acknowledgement that you weren't going to get major policy done. I don't think it matters that much for the markets. Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema have already 
create a deadlock in Washington. I think September or November is just going to solidify that. So putting it all together and then wrapping it up, you know, we think you still have economic expansion for the next couple of years. There's heightened risks around it. Upside on the markets are lower, but we think that stocks still offer a better opportunity than bonds. We think there's minimal to kind of modest upside over the next couple of years versus bonds that are still going to be under pressure. We think you probably do have a red wave coming in November. Um, and we think the United States is the next great emerging market. So I don't know if I have time for questions. Do I have some time for questions? All right. I hope you do have some questions. Otherwise, it was a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm glad I made the trip, and I hope it was as good for you as it was for me. All right, who's got questions? Yep. Yeah, so great question. Did everyone, was everyone able to hear the, the general gist of the question about how to think about bonds in a kind of pension scenario? What's priced in the market in terms of Fed action? So, look, I, I'm an asset allocator across retail and institutional portfolios, so I, I, I don't abandon bonds. I'm, I'm not a believer in that. Um, first thing I'd say is remember, cash is bond. Right? Zero, the, the zero to three year part of the curve. Those are bonds. They're just very short duration bonds. So that can be a part of a solution. That's one. Number two, right? if you're a long-term investor here and you're not very tactical, I don't know how much you want to do. Because right, as I think through this right now, here's what I'm dealing with. I've got a break-even rate out at any maturity that's sitting somewhere, let's say on the two-year, that's sitting about 50 basis points above where the two-year yield is. right? I can't imagine you're going to kill inflation until you get interest rates at least to the break-even rate so that I've got a positive real interest rate to slow down, slow down the economy. Now, that can happen one of two ways. Either the Fed is going to be pulled in to about 50 more basis points or more of hikes over the next two years than what's currently priced in, or the inflation break-even has to fall because I'm expecting lower growth. So then the question is, which one of those do I think is right? I think it's the former. I think the economy is strong enough. I think inflation is hot enough. And I think that the pace and the trajectory of their rate hikes is late enough and slow enough to allow inflation and economic growth to still persist and cause them to have to do more. So in that environment, what am I going to want in my portfolios from a fixed income perspective? I want to shorten duration wherever I can. right? If I'm an intermediate, I want to go to short intermediate. If I'm in short, I want to go to ultra short. If I'm an ultra short, I want to move some to cash. Not all of it, but move incrementally in that direction. I want to stay overweight credit for a time, because that implies I still have a strong economy there. And I want floating rate securities wherever the hell I can find them. Right? Those are the three things I'm going to do. But I'm cognizant that that's all limited time offer. Right? That at some point over the next year or two, and I don't know when it is, because it's impossible to know. At some point, I will have the hike that breaks the camel's back. And that hike will be the one where now all of a sudden I'm starting to price in slower growth. So I want to go underweight credit. And rates are going to fall because of that slower growth, and so I'm going to want to go long duration. I don't know when that is. So here's what we've done in, in our portfolios that are, are kind of most similar to yours. I'm tilted in the direction I think is most likely, but I've pulled in my bets. So I was, I did have my duration at about 87.5% of our benchmark throughout the entire bond portfolio. I'm now at about 95% of my benchmark. So I'm still short, not quite as sure as I was. I'm still overweight credit, but not nearly to the point where I was. If you, a year ago, I was 50 to 100% of my max overweight in investment grade corporates, in high yield, right, across the board. Now, I'm neutral all those things. I've got a little bit of an overweight in mortgage backs, right? I still have a yield curve flattener, but less than what I did. I still am buying floating rate, but I'm being more selective in terms of price. I'm tilted in that direction, but less so. If you've got a very long-term horizon, you know, I'd look to add the bonds as they continue to sell off. I and mean, I can't imagine 10 years is going to go much above three, three and a quarter, 
which was the peak of last cycle. So, you know, maybe I throw a log in every you know, 25 basis points or so. That, that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. But right now, what you just have to understand is even if you're in something that has, you know, one year of duration, two years of duration, you still might be looking at 50 basis points a hit in terms of what's priced in versus what might come. And, and it could be higher than that. We'll have to see how the inflation plays out. Does that answer your question? We, 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 can, go in, we can go into more detail, but I, I don't want to put everybody to sleep. It's early. <laughs> any, any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. I hope this was informative, and have a great rest of your conference.